Karen. I'm the landscape curator at Industry Garden, and um, I'm so grateful that all of you came out this afternoon. Um, so I bet many of you have been here before, and um, you might know stories that I don't know. So please feel free to share them with me if, if you have those, because part of my job is to collect the site history and organize it. Um, otherwise, I'll just sort of tell you the narrative that I've been putting together. I've been working here for 10 years. Um, and if you have a question, please just ask, because I'm sure if you're wondering where the name Innisfree comes from or where their money came from, somebody else is wondering the same thing. So um, anyway, this property started as a private estate in the 20s. Uh, before that, it's pretty rocky and typically pretty steep, so it wasn't, not that much was happening here. Uh, the Tyrrell family had some pasture area across the lake, and there was actually something called the Lake House uh, a little farther down the shore. So the driveway that you came in on actually shifted, went along the edge of the lake to this big kind of dance hall. And I've, there's actually postcards of the lake where you see sort of Gibson girl era people. I, I can't imagine being in one of those skirts getting into a rowboat, but there you are. Um, and, uh, and since they called it a dance hall, I'm sure there was not just boating on the lake. There were other things happening here. But, you know, back when this was all Clinton Corners, it was kind of like the happening spot, I guess. And what so, happened to that building? Um, well, when the couple that's started to make this their private estate, Walter and Mary and Beck. They initially used that building a lot. They actually built a little cottage near it. The cottage is still standing. And that was basically bedrooms and bathrooms um, and a dish room because every cottage needs a dish room. Um, and then they used the big porch and the bigger open space in the lake house as their main living area. And they lived like that for about five years thinking about the design approach to take for the overall estate. They, in 1930, they built a big house that was across the lake. Um, Walter was an artist. He was a professor at Pratt. Uh, and he must have been devastatingly charming because throughout the course of his life, he met all these women that helped him do things. Um, so he grew up in Dayton, Ohio. His father was a groundskeeper at a veteran's home. And somebody in that area paid for him to go study art in Europe. Um, his first wife, her, his, her father got him a job teaching on the East Coast. He was doing that. And then, um, well, Mary and Beck was a gardener and also an heiress. So uh, it was her money here. Uh, that paid for the property. In fact, when they got married in 1922, it was a second later marriage for both of them. Uh, his wife had died. She was Kel Scandal. She was a divorcee. Um, she already had 900 acres here and their place on Fifth Avenue. Um, so together they developed this vision for the property, but they thought about it over in their little cottage in the lake house for five years. Eventually, when they built the house across the lake, they weren't doing much with the lake house, and apparently there, it just fell down. Like there was a huge snowstorm one year, and it just collapsed. Um, so, so anyway, so that's what happened to the lake house. Um, they, their design ideas were kind of all over the map. They actually went to Paris in 1928 to interview the Swiss French modernist architect Le Corbusier who was the sort of leading edge of modernism. And that was the same year he finished a house called the Villa Savoy, which is still thought to be the most important modernist house ever. And, um, and the Becks decided, no, this Le Corbusier guy, he should really only work in South America. Nobody else ever thought that, only them. If we had a house here built by that architect who's so famous, um, I could probably give every visitor money because we'd have so much. Um, he built one building in the U.S., it's at Harvard, and he consulted on one other project, something small in New York City, the United Nations. Um, so uh, after they decided not to do that, they, 
they went completely in the opposite direction and they they decided to build a copy of a Queen Anne building at the Royal Horticultural Society's garden at Wisley in England. And Queen Anne architecture is kind of a mashup of Tudor styles and other stuff. So this house was had some half timbered stuff, had some brickwork, had some stonework, it had a very fanciful um, slate roof and uh, they were designing very proper English gardens around their very proper English country house and um, Walter Beck apparently told Marion that it was an aesthetic mistake. Um, I think I'm not as nice as her because she said, okay darling, let's go to Europe on a study tour, we'll get some new ideas. I think I might have been, you know, I just paid for this giant house and now you don't like it? <laughs> um, so actually at the British Museum, someone showed them a scroll painting of a Tang Dynasty garden, Chinese garden, you know, 700 and something, um, created by a poet and painter named Wang Wei. And I'm a landscape architect by training and I think clients that they want one extreme and then they want the other and then they don't really know what they want, they're pretty difficult to work with. But this scroll painting became the lasting inspiration for industry. Um, and it looked just like the garden. So even though this garden, the Wang Chuan Villa was in a river valley, it was like this. It was deep wooded slopes coming down to water's edge, undulating topography, big rock outcroppings. What the Becks loved about this property was the sort of erratic glacial topography. What they were doing by trying to make it look like England was erasing all of that. They were regularizing it. And so what Wang Wei did in his Chinese garden was embrace this very wild landscape and set gardens into that. So they found a way that they could garden like they wanted to, but kind of keep the personality of the landscape, which is why Marion Beck bought it all. Um, so Walter Beck called these, this sort of placemaking idea, cup gardens. So kind of like Le Corbusier should only build in South America, no one else talks about Chinese gardens with cups. So that's just Walter Beck, art professor, trying to explain maybe to pea brain Westerners this idea. But the concept is kind of like a garden room, just a little looser. So in his mind, it's clearly defined and inwardly focused. So here they, they sort of exploded that idea to make it any scale. So in a three in this natural bowl focuses our attention on the lake. So that's one scale of cup garden but you could go all the way down to a single rock which now has mosses and the you know, native columbines probably still blooming on a few. So that could be a whole garden in and of itself. So, but it, it just gave them a way to work with the native topography and the, sort of in the native landscape here. When they went in for Chinese stuff, they went all in. So they started to become quite serious collectors of Chinese art. Um, they're, textile collection actually was a big deal and it's now at, at Harvard it's at the Fogg Museum at Harvard if anyone is that interested you can go online they've started to pay more attention to female collectors so they acknowledge Marion Beck as the sort of collector here and you can see some of her pieces they're sort of extraordinary um, they were at a lecture in 1938 at Harvard about Chinese gardens and then met a young guy then named Lester Collins. He was a senior in college. He was at Harvard. He was studying English, of all things. Uh, but he had convinced the faculty to accept a thesis on the picturesque style in English garden design and theater set design. What that has to do with English, I still can't really tell you. But, um, but he was looking at English landscapes like the Becks had been. He was thinking about Chinese landscapes because in 18th century Europe, any, like, I don't know if you've been to Kew, one of the Royal Horticultural Society's gardens, they made this wild garden in the 18th century and they put a giant um, pagoda in it. So this Chinese stuff was a big a sort of part and parcel of these naturalistic landscapes in Europe. 
In the United States in the 18th century, nature was dangerous. We weren't creating naturalistic landscapes because you could die in the woods, you know? It was like, no thanks. So we were actually going backwards a bit to 17th century garden styles and making very geometric, you know, if you think about colonial gardens or colonial revival gardens, which we would see more of, they're actually more like Baroque gardens in Europe. So we kind of missed the whole Chinese craze here. By the 19th century, when we thought nature was tame enough that we wanted to invite it in, we wanted to design naturalistic landscapes, Japan had opened. And so people were looking at that. So Innisfree is pretty unusual because it has this Chinese sort of root. Um, they started working with Lester Collins. He came here his, the spring of his senior year, built a beautiful waterfall with Beck, did a few other things and they formed a lifelong friendship. So he took off, he traveled for two years through Asia studying gardens, kind of Asia writ large. I mean, Afghanistan, India, Nepal, Tibet, China, Japan, Korea, and then a lot of these countries have different names, but you know, Indonesia, Cambodia, Thailand, stuff like that. So he leveraged his Harvard contacts. He met all the scholars, all the designers, all the curators, um, you know, if you think about global politics at the time, you know, a lot of the Imperial Museum from China had uh, moved to Taiwan. So he went to Taiwan, he met Madame Chiang Kai-shek. You know, this is a kid who's just finished college, right? Uh, anything from the Imperial Museum that he wanted to see, they unpacked to show him. So I think that Harvard network must have been, you know, working double time for him. But he came back with this really unusually deep scholarly understanding of kind of pan-Asian design ideas and art ideas and a, and a long, like lifelong passion for these cultures. The Becks collected Chinese stuff. They actually had um, Chinese speakers here during the war translating some documents for them because almost nothing was available in English. So we have some um, Chinese texts where only pages with illustrations, of course, you know, they paste a little translation in so they could learn, but, but they never went to Asia. So it was really Collins who was bringing the kind of boots on the ground experience here. Um, Walter Beck liked to make these little assemblages of rock, these cup gardens. Um, he'd get an idea, Marion was the gardener, he'd say, I want something kind of feathery and gray, and she know, fill in the blank. Um, and the three of them, though, they worked pretty well together. The Beck soon had kids. They wanted industry to be their kind of lasting contribution to the world, um, their child. And Lester had kind of, they bet on a dark horse, you know, the, the, the kid talking to the people who probably paid for the lecture. He turned out to be a big deal in the world of landscape architecture. He came back from his travels went to Harvard to study landscape architecture, actually um, joined the faculty at Harvard and quickly became the dean, the head of landscape architecture at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. Um, he was a really influential teacher, um, quite influential designer, but he mostly worked as a sole practitioner. Um, so very few clients want to pay the top designer rate to do drawings. So he did a lot of work in Washington, D.C. So much work that you've definitely seen it before. He literally shaped the face of the Capitol. Um, he redesigned the Hirshhorn Sculpture Garden. He designed, uh, he was a lead designer for the Enid Haupt Garden, which is in front of that crazy castle, the Renwick Castle. He did a master plan for the National Zoo and designed some of the exhibits there, like the Panda exhibit. Um, worked at the National Arboretum, the National Cathedral, Kennedy Center did about 30 parks for the National Park Service along Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, so you've seen his work if you've been to D.C. Uh, but he's not really a household name. The Smithsonian was working on some stuff and they said, we have one drawing with his name on it. And I said, yeah, but that's like, he, and they're like, but he's copied on everything. Every letter, every everything. Why is Lester Collins all over everything? It's like he was the idea guy. Um, but he'd tag in with big firms where they had minions that would do, do the grunt work. And um, so I think there was a short period where he had a, um, a draftsperson doing work for him. And there was one client, the Graham family, 
Washington Post and Florida politics. He designed a whole town for them called Miami Lakes. And it's, um, you know, it, it, it's incredible. And it, it now, today, people credit, they look at this Miami Lake city, which is little walkable community centers, a main, like, main street downtown, kind of curving roads, lots of trees, high quality of life. Uh, and so that became a model for development in the southeastern part of the United States. Our guy Lester. But anyway, the Grahams who developed that, they loved him so much that he designed everything there, even the signs. And I think he must have loved working for them because, you know, uh, it's just a pretty steady gig. Um, Where would he work at? Was he at Harvard still teaching as he was doing these? Yes and no. Oh, okay. So um, so he he really liked teaching and he developed lifelong friendships with some of the other faculty but also his students. But I don't think he liked department politics. Oh. So um, he eventually quit and went to Japan in the 1952-53 as a Fulbright scholar, kind of the mid-career award. So he went back to Asia to actually the the historians that he met with there in 1939 um, were told him about this early Japanese garden design manual and it hadn't been translated into English and he went back and he found a scholar that he could work on that create the first I'm like 90% sure the first English translation study traditional Japanese garden design and construction techniques and um, so so he did that and then he relocated, when he came back he moved to Georgetown because he had been associated with Dumbarton Oaks, have you guys know that place? It, so it was a beautiful private estate in Georgetown given to Harvard. That was the model that the Becks wanted here. They wanted to make this study center with their collections and they wanted to have the garden open to the public. Um, so he was doing some of his design work when he was at Harvard and he was doing more when he was living in Georgetown. Um, some here, like, because eventually he lived here for half a year. So um, in the early 80s when his son uh, quit high school so he could go to Caltech to get his PhD, you know, real dummy, um, the, the Collins sold their, their townhouse in Georgetown and so they had had a house in Key West, one of those big 19th century conch houses. And um, so they were there in the winter and then they were here in the summer. But that was just the last 10 years of Lester's life. So um, before that, he'd come in, you know, as often as possible, but it was shorter trips. Um, so that whole time, it was just one of many projects around the world that he was doing. He, like, designed the grounds for the American Embassy in Cairo. He did a lot of work on the Queen Aaliyah Airport in Jordan. So he, he really had a a substantial practice. Other people um, knew him. <laughs> yeah, other Apparently. people knew him. So when he died, the Washington Post did this incredible article where they interviewed all these other designers. He was kind of like the designer's designer. All the design people knew him. There was some... Um, Washington has its own sort of subset of the social register, something called the Green Book. So he was the guy for that. Uh, and then there was some article that talked about him as, you know, there's for the top designers. Um, well, you know, there's so many choices for interior design and architecture, but for landscape architecture, there's only one, and it's Lester Collins. So all these people were, that worked with him and collaborated with him over time, you know, they said, we think he's the greatest unsung architect of the 20th century. We think he's been so influential. We think whatever. Well, here we have his life's work, his masterpiece, right in Millbrook. And, you know, a lot of people, like a friend of mine, her family lived over the hill, a pond farm, and she's like, I just never thought they wanted any help. Well, think about it. Lester Collins was here. He was trying to run the public garden from 1960 to his death in 1993. They didn't have any money, because guess what? Marion Beck announced in 1957, after Walter died in 1954, that they were going to set up this foundation, they were going to do this Dumbarton Oaks thing, and it was going to be a study center and a public garden. Isn't it fabulous? And I'm going to give them a $1 million endowment. Oh, and Lester Collins will be the president. When she died in 1959, she was in debt. They decided to actually pay out the bequest that she had made, which I think 
maybe wasn't the best idea because she was already in debt. So they ended up $200,000 in debt. Today, those $200,000, $1959, that's $2 million in debt. That's how industry started. So he was really, they had to go from 20 to 25 gardeners to five overnight. If you, your family worked here on that staff, there are a lot of people that are like, why, he fired everybody, what happened? It's like, there was no money. <laughs> Um, and they didn't want to badmouth the Becks because, because they were friends. So they weren't publicizing that. But Collins was here, and then he was all over the world working on his practice. After he died in 1993, his wife ran the garden. Petronella Collins was smart. She was feisty. She didn't have a driver's license. So when she came up here from Key West, and Key West, they walked everywhere. Here, she was here in that little cottage. It wasn't that they didn't want to make connections and meet people in the community. And, um, they're just, they were just here. I mean, they were, they were friends with the power brokers in Washington. They did this interesting thing where they were sort of, hi, um, my daughter's doctor. Um, <laughs> like, like, I think we started to go to her when I was like this. Um, my daughter will start college in the fall. So. Um, <coughs> Sorry, you didn't need all that for your video. Maybe you can edit that part out. Um, but um, so, I don't know, where was I? So, so she was here, and they were just basically trying to keep the garden going. And so through sort of like extreme thrift and these really innovative ways that Lester Collins developed to work with the environment to make a garden, and I'll talk a little about that, they kept this giant property going and pretty much intact. I mean, I've done garden preservation my whole career. There's no other site like this in the world. Full stop. It is the largest, most intact, modernist landscape in the country, if not the world. It's one of the biggest design landscapes, one of the most important. Um, this guy was, you know, he was, he was up here. And it wasn't just the design stuff. What he had to develop here because they couldn't afford anything, were ideas to make a garden. We have a 185 acre garden, we have a part-time seasonal maintenance staff, and we probably have six people on that part-time staff right now. Um, we do this all. Industry is recognized around the world, more than in Millbrook. <laughs> I mean, you know, the longest time, like, oh, I've never heard of it. And, you know, you live on South Road or something. Um, but, you know, industry is in, Great Gardens of America, you know, Gardens of the Future. You know, these are the kinds of titles that people come from all over the world to include industry in, because they they know what. I mean, I, I grew up in the Hudson Valley. I came here all the time. I'm like, oh yeah, it's another pretty place. But what Collins did was he he was a Quaker. He was very thrifty. His youngest brother said, no, no, my brother was cheap. Um, so he came from a long line of farmers. He grew up in Moorestown, New Jersey. His family had been farming in Moorestown since the 1670s. They were still farming the same land, but their holdings had expanded to be basically up and down the eastern seaboard. His dad grew most of the fruit in New Jersey. There's a big auditorium at Rutgers named for him, also named Lester Collins. And his grandfather, um, well, he was trying to figure out how to grow avocados in Florida. That's how they met the Graham family, because they were farming down there. The Grahams were also farming down there. And his, his, his uh, grandfather was running a little low on cash for this project, because he had this land that he thought was great, and he wanted to grow avocados there. He was building a bridge to get there. He kind of ran out of cash. His kids came in and said, well, we'll help you out with this project, Father, if um, we can do some development there, kind of like Atlantic City. Well, that was Miami Beach. So Collins Avenue, the Collins Bridge, that's, so Lester was a farmer who went to Choate Harvard. You know, he was on the social registry, belonged to all the right clubs, but they were, they were intellectuals. They were, you know, pretty lefty, Cambridge and, and Washington, D.C. So um, people would come from all over everywhere to hang out here. It was like a salon. You know, all these sort of leading academics, thought leaders, political leaders were like, uh, one of our trustees, his wife is now a trustee, has known Lester for, you know, like, well, Lester's been dead since 93, so, you know, that's a while. Um, but he said he was visiting them one time in Key West, and the governor 
of Florida showed up at his door late at night because he just had some event and he wanted to stop in and see Lester. And so he's like, we're, we're just finishing dinner and this whole entourage swarms in. And it's, you know, whatever one of the grounds was the governor, Bill, I guess. And um, so when they were here though, they were just working. They were just, you know, trying to get the garden stuff done. Um, so I think where we are now is we've gotten Innisfree listed on the National Register of, of Historic Places. For anything that's achieved significance, this is a lot of jargon, I'm sorry, in the past 50 years, you have to meet even higher standards. So um, we met and exceeded them. So we were recognized for exceptional significance. And it, Weirdly, you can be on the National Register at the local level, the state level, or the national level. So, Weathersfield, uh, which I love, and I, we're doing a program with them tomorrow, they got listed on the National Register for statewide historic significance. So, the firehouse in my, where my, my stepdad lives, it's on the National Register for local significance. But we got national significance an exceptional national significance because because we showed that everything like throughout Colin's life so until 93 is important we're now being um, strongly encouraged to apply for national historic landmark status so in the United States that's you know that's like Olana stuff like that um, so we've got that historic significance part we're kind of documenting that um, but what's really attracting attention is that Lester more than doubled the size of this garden and made it a place that feels great to be in, I think, especially if you're not in the dusty parking lot, um, mm -hmm. with very little money and very little staff. So if you've been into the city and you've been on the High Line where they converted a raised and elevated train line into a beautiful urban park for a bajillion dollars, and that's a technical term, right? And it costs about that much to keep it going every year. I mean, you can really only do that in a neighborhood where, like, Diane von Furstenberg is looking out at the High Line and giving you a lot of checks. Industry is a model for ideas that any community, any homeowner, could work with nature, but also be thinking about design and, and take care of it. So I think what we're trying to do now is, is be able to codify these really revolutionary ideas so that we can make sure that we're continuing them as we maintain and preserve the garden. But then our goal is to start really teaching them, actively teaching them. And um, there's literally people are coming from around the world that are thought leaders in horticulture to look at Lester's ideas because they are aligned with what's thought of today as cutting edge in, in the garden world, but they're still even ahead. So, you know, like, People are saying, oh, we're, instead of planting a mixed border where you choose the plants, like this plant is next to that plant because the stem of that plant is the same color as the flower of this plant. And, you know, I've, I, I've fed my family designing and maintaining gardens like that. Um, Lester's idea is I'm just going to work with the ecosystem here. I'm going to think about what design job I want it to do. Like there's an area over there where there's a big bog and it had gone to woods. So like the succession process here is open earth, like there's a fire or a big storm, bare earth basically, or a little bit of stuff on the ground to trees. And then the trees fall down and you start, starts all over again. So you come through the pine area, down and around, and he didn't want you to realize that you were right on the edge of the lake. So he let a thicket emerge. So every five to seven years we get in and we take out the biggest trees and the biggest shrubs because if you just let it keep going, it becomes trees and you see through the trunks. It doesn't make a wall. But this thicket of shrubs, you don't know that the water is right there. And meanwhile, birds and all kinds of things love there. It's like a very safe, you know, habitat area for them. A couple steps along, that thicket drops to be about chest high or, you know, waist high and you of the long view of the lake and so it's ta-da so it's sort of like a viewing platform and then it's completely different plants that community of uh, uh, that developed on its own just because more light hit the ground plate 
we didn't plant any of these plants. So every two or three years we get in there, we take more material out, more woody stuff. So more light hits the ground plane. So there's blueberries, there's Ilex reticulata, which has red berries all winter. There's native pitcher plants, you know, gorgeous they, They're bright red at certain times of the year. There's tussock sedge, all these. So you're sort of like, whoa, look at the lake. And then all these tiny little wonderful plants to check out. And then on the inland side, Right now, it's all Japanese primroses that have self-sowed, blooming back into the woods, and then ferns come along. So we have a fern glen, and all we do there is cut that once a year. So these are all different points on that succession process, but they they make three different gardens, three different plant palettes or plant communities. We didn't plant anything. And we do once a year in one area, every two or three years in another, and every five to seven years in another. This is the kind of thing that's making horticulturists come here from Germany. Like actually we had a whole like landscape architecture graduate program come here from Germany. Um, so, uh, so we have a long way to go to get our organization caught up with the garden because what the, the Collinses weren't doing was raising money and glad handing people because when they were here, they were working. They were working hard. Uh, and when they weren't here, they were busy doing other stuff. So I feel like they got the garden really evolved and, and interesting. And, and our, our nonprofit is maybe in the toddler phase. So even though the nonprofit has been running Innisfree since 1960, they really just used Whatever tiny little bit of money they had, they sold some things that belonged to Mary and Beck. Um, they, you know, there wasn't a big market for Chinese art. So it wasn't, you know, they had, the Becks had this great time collecting, but it wasn't like they, industry got all this cash from that. So it was really that kind of, we were pretty lucky to get some great financial advice from treasurers over the years. Uh, but I think, I think of, Lester is being like a, a radical pragmatist. Like some of his ideas, you hear it and you're like, wow, that makes perfect sense. But I think of myself as pretty sensible and I wouldn't get there from here. You know, I, I, but once you lay it out, it's like, oh, that's, that's terrific. So I think it's beautiful. It feels good. Why does it feel good? Because it's all about one of the things that he was thinking about is how do people feel in the landscape? Like his mantra with his, his students at Harvard was it's easy to design a landscape that looks great from an airplane that looks great from above the drawing looks gorgeous and as a designer I can t tell you that can be kind of seductive but you know he said think about what the people feel like when they're there he started a revolutionary program at Harvard where he'd get the, the students building small designs because it's really different when it goes from you know here to here and um, I wish I'd had somebody like that. When I was in grad school, I was so interested in making everything so clean that I think I designed a few things that were a little bit more like, you know, the Olympic Stadium in Berlin, you know, so sort of, whew. Um, so, so he, he uses how our senses work in designing this landscape. So you might go from a narrow shady path with a lot of detail to a wide sunny spot that's pretty spare. You're above something, you're below it the sounds change, even the smells change. So our, our mind is that we don't have a checklist, we're not going along, but actually all of that is mindfulness, right? It's really about being in the present and focusing on that. And he was an early proponent of landscapes as actively healing. He did a project in the 50s with Walter Gropius, a hugely important modernist architect, and he said, it was a big hospital complex in Chicago. I said, I want the landscape to do the same healing work that the doctors are doing inside. So I think people come to industry. I've said many times, if I had a blood pressure cuff in the parking lot, you know, unless you're like late for dinner and you're stuck here and I'm talking at you, you know, everyone relaxes here. And mm -hmm. you leave feeling not like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I, my garden doesn't look anything like this. I have to get home and work, work, work. Um, this doesn't have that <laughs> impact on people but but it is making you feel really present and noticing things because a lot of what we do is organic we have a terrific but you know very high biodiversity unusual plants and animals we have 
they're not so unusual now, but this is the third year that bald eagles have been nesting on the lake. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, bears and coyotes, and I've seen otters in the lake, bobcats, um, osprey, you know, all kinds of, lots of different kinds of owls. So, um, bald eagles. Yeah, yeah bald said. eagles, yep. Um, I, I was sort of hoping they'd be out showing off for you guys <laughs> now, but um, <laughs> anyway, so I, I I'm a I'm a I'm a Lester Collins fan girl. I'm sure you can tell. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, my, I've spent my career studying and teaching people, and I think that the things that we have to teach here are potentially revolutionary. Like I, some of you have probably been involved with public projects, and you know how hard it is to get the money together, and then you've got to figure out who maintains stuff, the staff, whatever. Just just you know, the thorn building. It's not a landscape, but it's the same kind of challenge. And um, so we have a path that has decades and decades and decades of sort of proven success that we could help people make, you know, welcoming green places in their communities or in their own backyards that are, you know, both interesting in a design sense, comfortable and, and healthy for humans and biodiverse. So. Yeah, because it's not it's not just the humans that it fits. Yeah. It's it's the dynamics of everything it is. else in there. Yeah. Like and I think and Yeah. And I think that um, it's interesting to me that Collins really felt that this was a place for people. So I think it's it's nature when we're not here, but when we are here it's industry because it's really about what you're doing here and but that other party was it was like an active partner in the in the design and in the maintenance of the landscape so all of that you know it's sort of like that circle of you know you take care of the land and people feel better and take care of the land and um so we're we're part of the network but i think his understanding and in, in a way his sort of generation of designers that um you know book titles by his peers you know landscape for living gardens are for people you know it was really like this is a place for people to do stuff so i feel really excited that you guys are here um i love the fact that we're going to have a free community day for northeast duchess residents on memorial day weekend um i like the idea that we're here as a resource free for school groups always even when industry was really had no money students could always come um, so we're trying hard to continue as good neighbors and um, so hopefully you'll keep going. I just as we sit here and hear you and listen just the bird mm -hmm. song around here is diverse it is, is that just the red-winged blackbird off yeah. the cattails or yeah. something it's that and it's higher and it's over here and it's just a whole diversity it is it's pretty I mean and I backyard. think the thing is we're in this um, amazing location. I mean, first of all, where we all live, Dutchess County sort of identified when they did like a some study about habitat and whatever. We're kind of at a big crossroads for not just individual habitats, but sort of groups of, of things. So it's pretty diverse. And then industry is, we're down from 900 acres to 185, but that land belongs to Rockefeller. They're the best neighbors, right? They study birds and ants. And, you know, they're not doing anything with that land. So, and then there's Cary. It's another 2,000 acres. So we're in this, talk about wildlife corridor, you know, and it actually works the same for plants, too. Like, if you think about native plants, you know, they're, they're able to kind of propagate. And so the seed bank here is very rich. The animal life here is very rich. The insect, insect life is very rich because there's all this land undeveloped or minimally developed that, that is intact. And so because we're this big water source, um, it's basically a glacial puddle. So this doesn't flow a lot of places, it's just here. So animals are coming to take advantage of it. Um, but uh, so, and we're, we have some more mowed lawn, right? The woods aren't mowed. So we see the animal life here. And the birds are here because they like those, a lot of them like those edge conditions where they're safe in a thicket or in a woods, but they can see other stuff and they get other food sources. So for instance, we get a grant from a, a state agency that usually supports 
they're, it's funding for living collections and they don't like designed landscapes. You know, they'd like this to be a zoo or a botanical garden, but they felt like the, the diversity of plant and animal life here was so high that they gave us money anyway because people can come and see it all here, even if it's maybe you prettier don't have to see a or caged different. Bird. Yeah, the cardinal. It they, they don't. Zoo they don't know. They don't care, right? <laughs> so we we did a birding walk here um, two two weeks ago. One week. It's all this time of year. Everything kind of blurs together. And um, so we started at seven thirty. It was fantastic. The first thing the guy saw was a loon going oh, overhead. Here? Yeah. So they might. You know, they have to go. They, so they're really high. And uh, I couldn't have told you it was a loon from the ground, but he he assured me oh, it was a loon. And um, so yeah, so there's there's crazy, wonderful stuff here as a result. So, um, so you guys all might, I mean, especially those of you in the sun, I'm sorry, might want to just go home. But if anyone wanted to walk a little in the garden, I, you know, you'd think I'd be sick of it. I'm never sick of it. So um, yeah, absolutely. I always see something new. Yes. How deep is the lake? Um, it's still over 30 feet deep in the middle. And I learned, I knew this was a glacial lake, but I learned we had a geologist come and do a walk with us and we're gonna maybe try to get him to come back and do another. So when the Laurentide ice sheet retreated for the last time, like between 15 and 13,000 years ago, depending on which glaciologist you talk to, um, it formed a huge glacial lake called Lake Washington. And I know none of you are gonna say that like, what, what somebody else told me the other day it was na named for, for George Washington and I was like okay George was old but we're talking you know <laughs> tens of thousands of years so yes in a way yes uh, so uh, the, I got this paper about Lake Washington which uh, I've yet to read um, but apparently it was like 20 or 30 feet higher than the current lake level and that there are flat areas, maybe this, um, that were deltas. So, so geologists that study this can look at the topography today and they can say, oh yeah, well that's where you can see at this height, so that was the, the lake level. So I'll be a Lake Washington expert after I read this paper. Um, but I also learned that there are, there are three fault lines here. So they're not active faults, but um, but so the way the topography jumps up quickly along that ridge, which continues down to the Taconic Hereford area, um, that's a fault line. So that was a shift and the stuff came up. So I'm always learning more stuff about it today, but yeah. So over 30 feet in the middle. Um, we did just get a, um, a DEC permit and some donor funding because the shallower bays in the lake silt in and with the drought and then the heavy rains that we've been having over the past few years, that really accelerated. So um, we didn't dredge, we did something called hydro raking. So in a very old lake like this, you can get these sort of mats of, of, of plant roots and things and silt. So it's like a floating island of muck. And mm -hmm. so the hydro rake thing just doesn't mess up the bottom, it just sort of scoops that we call the mud islands. You know, it's, I guess, you know, we're the land of the dummies here with like the cup garden and the mud islands. Those are not technical terms, but it's very descriptive. So, um, so we basically had this machine that looked like a cross between a snort, you know, from Are You My Mother, the, you know, Dr. Seuss thing, and, um, and a like Mississippi river boat with a paddle wheel. And that was just lifting this muddy muck. You know, and so we have this giant, fabulous compost pile but now we'll be back to open water back here. You can already see the bass nests. It's fantastic. I haven't seen the bottom of the lake there in so long, so the, the fish are super happy. And um, so we'll, we'll now try to raise money to do that in some the other shallower parts of the lake. But I guess that would have just, if you didn't take it out, it would fill in. Right, so the like lake would bob, eventually, the natural process bob. is that it would go away. It'd go away. It'd yeah. Fun. So, um, so it was really Whoa. deep. Like, I, I don't know if like Bill Finelli, if some of you know Bill, um, yeah. he worked forever with, with Lester Collins. And um, so uh, he actually built the bridge that connects so you can go all the way around the lake. And he told me that when they were driving, like sort of footing stuff in, that at the very edges, the land sides, 
you had to go down through like 50 or 60 feet of mud and that was still like towards shore. So 15,000 years of sediment, the lake was much deeper oh than 30 God. feet mm -hmm. when it was first created, you know. So, um, so yeah, so. Has anyone ever taken core samples, do you know? Uh, I don't areas? think like 50, so. 60 feet. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure he could have like, oh my God. You know, but like yeah. You would see then, you would analyze the pollen. There was Absolutely, there there's so much. What, I mean, because it, it would go right here. Well, so there's this <laughs> other. I, I was in search of geologists to talk, so maybe we can have this guy come and we could do a joint program. Yeah. Um, so there's a guy who works at the State Museum. I didn't know that geology in New York was, you know, kind of a turf issue, but um, <laughs> apparently, like the rocks on the west side are really different from the rocks on the east side. And not that many people are doing, are specialists in this side. There's a lot of people that are over there. So, um, so this one couple that wrote a book about the Ice Age in the Hudson Valley, I thought they'd know stuff. They're like, oh, right. well, we can come and give you our talk, but we're not going to come and talk to you about Innisfree. And we don't even really want to come to Innisfree Street. Um, <laughs> They're so, upstate. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, um, so then this guy who's a professor across the river, he came over, he was fabulous, and he's the one who's teaching me about the kinds of rocks we have in Lake Washington. But this other guy in Albany, I'm gonna get him, because he discovered the oldest fossilized forest, full stop, in Cairo, or Cairo, depending how, if you're an old timer, it's one way, if you're a newcomer, it's you know, whatever. That, that place across the river. Um, and so he wanted to talk about early plant life. Oh, and I, I was like, oh, sign yeah. me up. I have to convince my board. But it's yeah. like, you know, trees were not a thing for the longest it's, time. It's a, it's a bowl, and it's that's where you study it. I'm well, not, so they, it, he actually found this oh. fossilized forest in a <laughs> um, quarry, and it just, I wouldn't have known anything. It's just like shadow patterns, basically, on the ground. But those were the tree, the tree root system. And um, so here I've learned from Steve, the other um, geologist that, like the rocks on the, this side of the river, there's been a lot of turnover. And so, you know, there have been several mountain building events and then they've gone away. So we had like huge, huge, huge mountains over here. The Taconics were very tall, like the Himalayas. And um, so those are down under there somewhere now. Um, so the rocks over here, it's sort of the same stuff, but it's mostly metamorphized. So we have a lot of stuff around here called phyllite or phyllite, depending on, you know, dead language, whichever way you want to pronounce it. But that's basically shale that's experienced heat and pressure. So, so our rocks are just cooked a little more than the other side of the river. But for some reason, that means that there's, no, I don't know. So the, I'm hoping that our, the guy that was coming here will talk to us more and do some more work on the area. So fault lines, Glacial Lake, Washington, there's there's a lot of cool stuff. So. I, I'm sorry, I have another question. Yeah, bring it, I love it. it. Um, so when Lester Collins visited the Asian lands, different yeah. places, and you know, dreamed and was inspired by landscape ideas, yeah. did he bring actually bring plants back? That? He didn't. Did he mix. <laughs> he did. Uh, I mean, you know, it's interesting. He he was a plantsman. He wasn't doing that here so much. Um, he wrote specifically that this wasn't a museum of plants. Um, he was looking for plants that worked hard. You know, if a plant was invasive, but he could understand how to use it without having it take over, he loved it. Because what did he love more than anything else, just about, except for his wife? Uh, free. So free plants were good. Um, so plants that self-sow, plants that spread, it's all terrific. He, he drew on his family's history as fruit farmers. He actually did a little like sort of super low-key hybridization. Um, so he almost just with a handkerchief, you know, there were plants that he wanted more of and he called it assisted natural selection because especially in a closed environment like this bowl, you know, over time, there'll be differences that emerge. Like, like all the m mice and rats in the different New York City parks are slightly different genetically because they've been separated for so long. So plants do the same thing. So by crossing really successful, healthy, floriferous plants that were growing, 
he moved that process along more quickly. So he developed something called ecotypes, which are more suited to whatever the particular place is. So, so that's why our like Japanese primroses, which are certainly introduced, are now like growing in the bog down at the south end of the lake. Or um, there's fo yellow foxglove that I've seen growing out of a south-facing rock face. You know, they you, they sh they shouldn't be happy there, but they are. And um, so there are a few special plants here, but but this isn't like the Becks were collecting plants, um, and they were they were developing interesting plants themselves. I think Marion Beck had some like I haven't seen anything in writing, but I've heard that she was using this was pretty common. Like she was using radiation to develop um, you know different mutations of plants to develop. Uh, what she felt were attractive uh, things. Collins was not about radiation. He was using his Kleenex to like cross plants. But um, so Harvard's Ar Arnold Arboretum received several special hemlocks from Innisfree. They have one where they're they're propagating to send back. But um, you know, Suka is the botanical name for hemlock. Innisfree is what they call it, and it's tall and skinny. So. Um, was that irradiated then, or I don't know. <laughs> we don't. We don't know. Like, but because it's um, weeping hemlocks uh, were actually found in the woods in Dutchess County, so they look very Asian. They look very, you know, poodled, but they're about as native as you, they're hyper local. Um, so, who knows? I mean, they, we don't. We don't have records of all of that. We have a lot of records of Walter Beck wrote everything down. So we have card, like he loved to write everything on three by five cards. So we have a million three by five cards about color notes and I read this and this is what I thought. Um, but things like what Marion was doing with the plants or what Lester was doing, we have less about it. Um, so I think the two most important trees here, one is the cedar of Lebanon, which should not be hardy here. Uh, the Becks planted it, it's massive. Now, of course, with climate change, the cedar forests in Lebanon are super stressed. They're too hot. So I think if we can keep ours going, it'll be happier. Is so it that's, down that way? It's, it's it? sort of like over the hill. So it lost its leader, so it looks like kind of a big blue-green evergreen that's instead of... It's kind of, They are usually thick. They're not skinny like that, but it... So it's kind of a like a giant shrub looking like a big marshmallow um, and then the other are there's some deciduous conifers here that are called dawn redwoods and um, they were extinct or thought to be extinct so they were a tree known in the fossil record and then one tree or a little cluster of trees was found in China in the late 30s or early 40s so Harvard sent money to Chinese botanists to collect seed from that you know, living fossil is how they described it, and um, sent brought it back to Harvard where they propagated them, and then they sent the, the seedlings to botanical gardens around the world. So that tree was saved by that sort of cross-cultural collaboration, and one of the trees grown from the first batch of seeds, uh, Lester got it for the Becks. So, you know, what do you get for your clients who at that time could afford anything they wanted and loved all things Chinese. Well, an extinct Chinese tree. Um, so it's been an incredible success story. I planted a grove for my parents and I, uh, I'm almost ashamed to admit I bought those trees at Lowe's. Um, I'm sure they ordered them by mistake and I got them before they could kill them. But um, so, you know, uh, but but anyway, so we've, we've added more over the years, but one, you know, it's not so special anymore, but it's a great story, right? And so one of them has that sort of perfect provenance. Um, so and they're not related to the redwoods. They're not. So meta sequoia is like sequoia. Like I have a Tibetan terrier. It's not a oh. terrier. They're just like, we've never seen this dog before. It's the size of a terrier. Um, so it's like that. So. How did um, Walter connect with Burroughs? Um, he was... I would like to say a seeker, Walter Beck. So his art, uh, you might have seen some at Lyle, you know, he, there's some Christian art that he did, he did some, 
you know, sort of Asian religious subjects. He was he was interested in that kind of spiritual element in everything. And I don't know the specifics of how they connected, but he was a big correspondent with different people. And I think that way of thinking about nature, you know, the transcendental, you know, it's 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 that whole. Um, you know, Walter also wore evening cloaks for a guy who grew up the son of a groundskeeper. But you know, so he was an eccentric. But but that that like looking for meaning and seeing a lot of it in nature was a big part of his um, DNA, I think. Um, so so just like I think I think Lester and Walter were really similar in a lot of ways because they both thought deep thoughts and they both connected with crazy networks of people all over everywhere. Um, one was uh, one was his wife described Lester as a forthright Quaker, you know, and and Walter was you know living the living his artist persona. So and so the burrows etching that's on the wall on the steps going up there, how did that come about? Um well Probably Walter Beck's superpower as an artist was portraits. So there are several pastel portraits of Burroughs. Also, one is at, above the photocopier at the library, in case you're interested. Um, so, um, you know, I've studied art history my whole life, so there's iconography. And so, is it St. Jerome? Is it Walter Beck himself? Like. I don't know, but he liked Burroughs. He did a lot of portraits of Burroughs. Burroughs had a big beard, you know. So is that his patron saint? I, I don't, I don't know. Um, so it makes sense to me that it's Burroughs, but it could, it could be, it could be a lot of different people over there. So I haven't. Um, we we have. Um, oh, this is actually a good group. We have a a handwritten manuscript of a book that Walter Beck wrote. And I think it's mostly about industry. Um, so we might find some answers in that. But uh, right now I'm, I'm a little busy. And I'm dying. Like it's the kind of thing that I'd love to just dive into. But I, we're trying to do this big plan so that our preservation work is legit, really. Like we're not, we're not inadvertently making mistakes that take away from what makes industry important. And that really has to be the focus of my work right now. So if somebody is really good at reading, you know, uh, handwriting of somebody who was born in the late 19th century, like, come my way. Because we, we have a really cool stuff. So so I think it, I don't know. I mean, it, I, you know, like it could contain, like, well, when I was sitting on the terrace with my friend John Burroughs, um, I, I think there could be lots of cool stuff in there. But until we have, you know, last year, I think it was last year, oh, yeah. or actually the year before. So I was a full-time employee for the first time last year, and and um, that was the first time anyone other than the Collins, member of the Collins family, was working here full time. Actually, they were not even working here full time. So, um, so we're, we we we're still running lean, quite lean. So you but, can almost oh I'm sorry. Yeah. You can almost look at it as it's almost to create what is here now was two lifetimes, basically, you know, the Becks. Yeah, and the absolutely. And so you, it's a lifetime of work to, Yeah, I, I think know, so. I mean, bring it up you know, again. and I think that the, the, is this the garden now that is recognized as so significant, different from the Becks garden? Yes, it is. But the Becks knew that that had to change. They had a moss garden that had two full-time gardeners that they could only walk in once a week. So even they knew that that part couldn't survive in the public garden manifestation of ministry. They knew changes would have to be made. So, you know, Collins thought about, his mantra was kind of like how to make a garden that would be memorable, but that would sustain and survive public interest. So he was worried that, that all the cost savings that he had to do, the cuts, would make the place boring. So it was like, what's, what's enough? What makes it... What makes it interesting? What makes people come back? Um, and so there are a lot less, you know, there isn't a half acre cutting garden anymore that has a full-time gardener. There isn't a lot of that stuff, but it, 
but the feel, I think the idea of what probably would have appealed to Burroughs, this feeling of being in nature and having a special experience. I think that worked for, for Lester Collins too because as a Quaker it was you have your own connection to something bigger and um, so I think, yeah. All right, so those of you that aren't now too cold, you want to do this or you want to just come back tomorrow and tell them? I was here at the, at the Historical Society thing and I want to come. Okay, let's do it. I have not seen that either. I have not gone to that one. But I've gone on, on several of the curator walks and, and they had the docents doing uh, like a tour on the weekends. I've gone on several of those too. And I was here the first year I think it was up, the house was still up. So I went inside the house before they knocked it down. Oh.
you know, we didn't really plant any of this stuff, but we, these are all things that like to be on the edge, and so we're not mowing them, we're encouraging plants we like, we're getting rid of plants we don't like. And if oh. something that comes in and it's too big, you know, if, if it was all these shrubs, those are terrific. They're button bush, they're one of the best pollinator plants. But if it was all like that, you couldn't see the lake. And so in here, a lot of it is like, if we had a huge team of gardeners, we could get some of those things growing in those crevices. But also if we just, instead of weeding out everything that grows there, we weed out the bad things and we let the rest kind of mm -hmm. go along. Yeah, so it's it's not nature, and I think that's the key distinction. There is some gardening that's happening, but it's editing as opposed to right. like you will be like this. And so nature has ideas, and it's like, hey, I didn't think of that. That looks really good. So yeah. leave it. Right. Exactly. Um, or that's a terrible idea. So we're going to compost that one. Right. Uh, so did you get any feedback from the geologists about some of this? Yeah. So um, of course the two main types of rock here are pretty hard to tell apart. That was awesome. He's like, you know, in the Grand Canyon, you have all these different colored layers, and I can tell you exactly what they all are. Around here, everything's gray, and yeah. they're kind of like, you know, so phyllite and gray rocky are the two main types of rock here. And he's like, there can be pockets of other stuff, but it's all very similar. And he's like, some of it you actually have to look at under a microscope which he didn't bring her along with him but yeah so it was it was fun and you know it was just the sort of really the big story of this area where with several what i now know are called mountain building events and then the mountains wear away that and the these faults and you know that's it's kind of like it's been through the blender you know so, um, I find it fascinating too that, that this area with the geology here, the, the mountains were as high as the Alps. Yeah. And then with all of yeah. the erosion and exactly. all that. Exactly, you know. exactly. And so, you know, he's like, I have my students calculate, and it, he's like, I think it was something like they were like away, it was like a couple of millimeters a year. And so then you think about that, and it's like, that's, that's a lot of years. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Yep. We have a permit to kind of mess around with our eggs. Oh, wow. But I guess we didn't, you know, get to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, like, that. Yeah. Oh, that's it? Yeah. Okay, bye. 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 Bye.
know that the lake was right here. So he really, visitors, just the driveway <coughs> came in from the north, and you came in at the upper level into a courtyard for the house. And when he came through the house, that's the one place on the property that you can see there's a lower part of Tyrrell Lake. So it has this incredible long view down the lake. Um, and I don't know, he's kind of a bossy artist, I guess. So you had that had to be where you suddenly realized there was a lake here. So although they called this the meadow, there was a small clearing and it was mostly wooded. And when they built a reservoir up on the ridge that we're looking at to supply water to the garden and the house, it, um, there had been a stream here because it's a little valley, but it kind of stopped that up. So it really only ran when in the, in the spring, you know, with snow melt and stuff. Uh, so Collins rejiggered the water supply so the stream runs all year round again. Um, designed this really curving path, uh, set rocks in the traditional Japanese style that he just learned, created the water features in the way that he had been taught in Japan, um, planted it in a totally American way. Um, but then he also started looking at this and these natural landforms. Um, and by sort of starting to clear and making these patterns of light and shadow, then this sculptural land, which is what the Becks loved here, becomes part of the design composition. So he's really using light like James Terrell. I don't know if that's an artist. Maybe you've seen some of his stuff at Dia um, or Mass Mocha. But he, he bought a, a um, crater in the Southwest desert and, it, and he, he's, he got a MacArthur Prize, you know, one of those genius prizes. He basically used all the money to fly over the desert to find the perfect crater that would define the horizon so you can't see anything else. But how light works in that is, is the art. So this, in a way, like, you can see some great shadows and things, especially if you can see over there. And that's not anything that takes much ongoing maintenance but it means that the edges of our bowl are always changing and kind of adding interest. So these sculptural forms, the glacial black forest, thank you very much. So by mod modulating the light on them, he makes them a much more dramatic part of the this is a one of our one of our trustees loves these and I I almost got them out of here. Uh, so after Western Hall died, his um his wife who you know she was sort of the boss of this for all those years because she was the last birthday. So I think she um delighted in adding some of her own elements. I don't know, because I'm hoping some somebody from your group volunteers to help. So here's a um Eritima back in the pulpit. Yeah, I mean this will be a fun shot. Yeah. So pretty soon you won't see any earth in here. This will be quite green. They were in here getting some invasive plants out in the fall, so it got locked out. But it becomes very lush, very quickly in a practical way. We don't care. That's the thing. It's like, you know, uh, some of you might know Brad. Yeah, exactly. Some of you might know Brad Roller. He's one of our trustees. So when he started working here with us, and he's a great help, he said, Oh, the lawn here drives me crazy. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that on tape. You know, because it, it's like, you know, it's not, a, it's not, like, it's not all turf. And this spring, he's like, I've observed so many interesting and valuable pollinator plants. This lawn is so hard working, even if it doesn't look like a lawn, you know, there's stuff flowering in it. And that's, you know, escape garden plants and all this stuff. And he's like, and it's, it's really doing more, much more work than a traditional lawn. So he's a total farmer. So there's plants that, as long as it doesn't, 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 as long as Skunk cabbage. So we love skunk cabbage. So deer don't love skunk cabbage. And so unlike pasta, which gives you the same kind of big texture, big, you know, big scale leaf, uh, the deer would just demolish it. So Lester figured out that 
the skunk cabbage, it starts to look a little ratty in the early summer. If you cut it down, it reflushes. So you can keep this like fresh green. And it's a little bit of work, but it's not a lot of work. And um, so skunk cabbage is like our hero here. <laughs> <laughs> So this is, I guess, why I was asking you guys this way. So if you look at this oxbow here, you know, an oxbow can occur in nature, like the Thomas Cole painting of the Chanty River. Um, and there's a lot of, like, design streams. Uh, but Paul has used it, and he's interesting, he thought of this cup garden, the meadow, as the most important at industry. And I, I really, when I told you before that I'd come around the corner and I'd walk on those stepping stones and cross that bridge, I didn't get it. But when I started to kind of look at it in the round, because I had to figure out why Collins was saying that, because it's my job, um, that I started to say, well, look, you know, this shape this way speaks to the shape of Heather Hill, which is directly in front of us. And then we come around and the sort of bridge part of it connects our eye to the lake and across the lake. And then we come a little farther and the shape and it's suddenly making almost a perfect circle with that dumpling knoll. And so it's this incredible connecting piece. Um, this is another example of a place where the idea was where the big investment took place and the ongoing maintenance or even the capital cost of building it was de minimis. So by modulating the amount of vegetation along the stream, he makes the sort of each part of it more interesting. So that um, bog there with all kinds of wonderful plants is a giant filter. So it's helping the lake stay clean. Um, and there's always something blooming in there. And the contrast of that with this, where it's just this swoopy line. And I think the most beautiful thing Collins wrote about the garden was that here the reflection brings the sky down into the garden. And so it's just light and live. And then in here we've lifted some plants because there's been a little erosion on the slopes going down to the stream, so we need to fix it. But imagine a kind of middle amount, you know, it's like um, Goldilocks, you know, this one's just right. Uh, so, but just a simple tactic like that where they're really all the same plants, it's really the same stream, but by kind of treating each section a little differently, like, like that bog I talked to you about where the plants are completely different. Nature's grown them all, but it's just because of obviously different amounts of light in the ground thing. So just in thinking of things like that, you know, this is a pretty low maintenance area, but it, there's a lot for me to check out. So, um, so yeah, so obviously this thing starts to get a little bit